Okay, it's, uh, it's uh, the 28th of May at 2 uh, CST. Uh, you are joining the Big Data Pilot Demo Days. Uh, we want to welcome you all for joining. Uh, we hope you're all safe. Um, and uh, we would like to, uh, to start this, um, this very practical Big Data Pilot Demo Days uh, today. So um, we hope you, you will enjoy it today. Let me show who is going to be speaking. So today, uh, the, big data, the Big Data Pilot Demo Day is going to be touching upon the Big Data Stack Connected Consumer. Um, we have four speakers today. So we have Despina Kopanaki from Forth. Uh, she's a member of the, she's a project uh, partner in the IBDAS uh, project, uh, one of the, the, one of the projects uh, hosting this series. We have Orlando Avila Garcia from Atos, uh, Big Data Stack member as well. Uh, Bernat Quesada from Worldline, Big Data Stack member partner uh, in the Connected Consumer case. And Anastasia Sidiropoulos from ATC Research and Innovation Lab, one of the Big Data Stack partners as well. Um, so I wanted to take you through the agenda. So uh, the agenda will be very uh, brief. It's, it's four points. Uh, we have the Big Data Pilot Demo Days, uh, where Despina will tell you all about the joint effort. We have the Big Data Stack Connected Zoom Consumer, uh, where Bernat will set the requirements. We'll have the user interface and data visualization by Anestis, and then really the step-by-step -step demo by Orlando. And then you'll have all the time to, uh, to ask your questions that you may have uh, in two ways. So there's, there's a button on the, on the bottom of the screen where you can see Q&A. You can type in your answers that you have at that moment, just as you don't forget them. But at the end, we will, we will surely come back to them and provide you with the opportunity to answer them, to, to ask them um, real, uh, in real time um, uh, and we'll open the floor uh, in, uh, with your audio as well, because now you're muted, but at the end, you have the, the chance to, uh, to, to really ask your question. Um, so we would really like to understand who you are, uh, what your, your, your background is a little bit in terms of, of big data or, uh, or industry. Um, so for that reason, uh, we would like to ask you five questions in a, in a poll that will now pop up. Um, so thank you, Andrea. So these are the, the questions. So we would like to ask you to, um, to, uh, to start answering them so that we know who, who's, on the, who's on the call. So to which of our stakeholder types do you belong? Uh, are you a big data provider? Are you a big data technology? Uh, are you from the real, uh, real retail sector? Are you a big data technology provider? Are you from research and academia? Are you a policymaker maybe or from a standardization body or other? Okay, so research and academia, other, retail sector as well. So I see quite a lot of people from research and academia. Big data provider as well. So 40% is from uh, research and academia, 25 from the retail sec sector, and 13% is, is a big data provider, and 22% mm. uh, is, uh, is uh, from other. And are you working with big data? All of you have said yes. Then the third question, are you interested in big data technologies to optimize your customer experience? All of you have said yes, and 10% uh, have said maybe. Uh, so we hope uh, that, we'll come, that we can provide you with uh, interesting information for you today, for your organization. Then the fourth question is, what is the main barrier or risk preventing you from implementing big data analytical solutions in your organization? So 10% has answered costs, then 80% has answered lack of expertise, and 10% has answered the uncertain values or the return on investment. And then the last question we've asked you is, are you familiar with Kubernetes? Then 40% of you said uh, yes, 
and 60% of you said no. So are you familiar with Kubernetes and its concept? So that's quite, uh, quite a, uh, a nice group uh, of different, uh, different backgrounds. So that's what, perfect. Okay, so uh, we would like to stop the poll now and I would like to open the floor to Despina uh, who will tell us all about why, why these projects are joining forces. Thanks, Marik. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending uh, today's uh, uh, webinar. Uh, as you are aware, uh, Big Data Value PPP Summit uh, 2020 went virtual due to COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, this pushed uh, new ways of thinking, new ways of collaboration. So uh, why? Why Big Data Pilot uh, Demo Days? Uh, we did find some common ground. Marik, if I can ask the next slide. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the new data-driven uh, industrial evolution highlights the need for big data technologies to unlock the potential in various application domains. So uh, the Big Data Value PPP projects, IBDAS, Big Data Stack and Track and Know, um, all of them are delivering innovative technologies to address the emerging needs of data operation and ap applications. Um, all the projects uh, on board pilots to uh, exhibit their applicability in a wide variety of sectors and to fully exploit the sustainability of the developed technologies. And indeed, we do have a uh, representative for a lot of sectors, for example, finance, uh, telecommunication, manufacturing, insurance, healthcare, um, and many more. So the three projects are in the final year. Uh, they are ready to demonstrate the developed uh, technologies uh, to you, uh, to the interested end users uh, from the industry and also technology providers. So uh, the projects that uh, join their forces, uh, Marik, if I can ask the next slide, please. So here you can see the list. Um, first one, big data stack, holistic stack for big data applications and operations. IBDAS, Industrial Driven Big Data as a Self-Service Solution, Track and Know, uh, Big Data for Mobility, Tracking Knowledge, Extraction in Urban Areas, and uh, recently uh, Policy Cloud joined us, uh, Cloud for Data Driven Policy Management. Uh, so uh, all of the projects are joining forces to showcase their application of innovative technologies in a wide variety of domains, and uh, Policy Cloud aims to show the adaptability of uh, big data stack uh, mature technologies and uh, showcase uh, its uh, implementation to the um, policy making sector. Uh, so in the next slide, you can see an overview uh, of the 10 webinars that we have designed. Uh, the first one took place uh, last week. Um, today we have the second one. Uh, and uh, by the mid of July, we plan to conclude all the 10 uh, webinars. So don't forget to check uh, the Big Data Value um, webinar webpage where we constantly update all the information for the upcoming uh, web webinars. And we do hope to uh, join us in all the series. Uh, so uh, Marik, thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, back to you. Thank you, Despina. Thank you very much for this overview. Um, so I would now like to give the floor to Bernat uh so i'll stop sharing but not hello everyone i don't know if you can see my screen not yet not yet one moment now almost Yes, we see your screen. No, no sorry, yeah, this. Great. Okay. One moment. Now. 
Yes, perfect. Okay, <clears throat> sorry the delay. Okay, <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Bernard Quesada. I'm working as a project manager uh, within Worldline uh, in the area of e-commerce. Uh, but I'm also collaborating in the big data stack in the connected consumer use case uh, concretely that we are going to see today. Uh, we are the use case owners. Uh, and what is the, the connected consumer uh, use case about it? Uh, connected consumer uh, it, me it means uh, that if we think uh, when we think of connected consumer we have to think of a customer of a grocery shop who is able to connect uh, to the apps of for example of his favorite uh, grocery shop through all kind of devices ranging from a personal computer to a mobile phone or a tablet and from all of these devices uh, thanks to to this, our users should be able to receive personalized promotions and products according to a number of different things, such as his or her tastes, or according to, to his or her purchasing behavior in the past, okay? So the, the use case is, uh, uh, is about that, no? It's, it's about uh, e-commerce and, and, and about uh, uh, end users uh, buying, uh, buying uh, items in a supermarket, for example, or, or using a customer care application on which they can activate uh, uh, promotions for them, okay? So this, this would be the context uh, that uh, will help you to understand the, the presentation, okay? And uh, we are uh, talking about grocery. Uh, concretely, our use case uh, is about grocery, about, about food, about supermarkets, hypermarkets, which is the retail industry. And if we uh, want to understand why uh, why we have uh, made the application we are doing, uh, we have to understand what are the problems of the retail sector uh, currently. The business of retail is very highly competitive market uh, on which each customer matters. Uh, in the last years, uh, many new uh, uh, competitors has has arrived uh, to the market due to the globalization. Uh, it means that uh, in the last five ten years, uh, the, the the market has increased the number of competitors, and, and and keeping a customer with you is is really valuable. No, and what can you do to 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 get that that goal? Uh, you uh, you need to to offer an attractive something different to the customer. No, and uh, in this way, uh, big data can help retailers by by pro by providing uh, uh, big data uh, together with analytics no nowadays uh, retailers uh, don't don't use uh, mo not all of them but the many of them the the classic ones the uh, at least in grocery they, they are not using uh, big data technologies of course if you go to amazon they are using it uh, but not not the 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 the, the classic retailers the ones that 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 we know uh, the local and the national retailers mainly, and and uh, this is still a challenge. No, uh, so our use case is about that. We are we are trying to do some predictive analysis. I will I will go next. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, in our use case, we are uh, we are collaborating with a real. Uh, uh, grocery distribution company, a well-known company in Spain. Uh, this company uh, is, has more than 3,000 physical stores, 1.2 million of products in the catalog. In their catalog, uh, they have uh, around 1 million customers, and they are selling in two years like 3,000 million uh, ticket items, uh, products, no? order items. We would say. Uh, altogether, this is this means that we have to to manage one terabyte of data in, in the use case, the, uh, of real data, I would say. And, and what is the, the application we are going to build about? Uh, our intention is to start by building for them a, a collaborative filtering recommender system that could help uh, our partner to personalize product predictions uh, for their customers. And in this way, uh, they, can, they will increase uh, their customer satisfaction and, and loyalty, and, and they will be able to keep uh, to keep them with them, no? and maybe to increase also the, their sales. No? Uh, collaborative filtering recommender. It means that uh, the the recommendations we are going to to calculate are uh, are calculated uh, based on what uh, other customers similar to me, for example, uh, are 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 buying no? in the store. We are not talking about content-based uh, recommender system. 
which would be a, a different different one okay and then if i go further and, and i and i show you the application architecture of our new system basically it consists of a of a batch processing uh, <clears throat> uh application on which uh, we are dealing with with the orders uh, with the order items uh, that the that the customers are buying every day and, and we are from that order items that would arrive periodically we are calculating uh, the model on which uh, we store for every customer and, and product we are storing what is the the probability let's say that the, this customer and this product uh that, that this customer likes this product okay this is one one model we this is something to run periodically we also have a, a, another another flow of data which is uh, a service a service that 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 provides the recommendations to the users okay this to the, to the applications to these applications i was saying at the beginning that that the, the users are using to to interact with the with the favorite shop like the e-commerce application or the customer care application is a simple web service that is providing information to them and we also have a real time processing model on which we are capturing the events that those users are 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 doing with the with the applications of the, of our of our of our grocery company and and from that events we are recalculating the model that has been calculated periodically uh, in batch mode uh, okay so this, these are the flows that we want to model in big data stack no uh, each as you can see each uh, the flows are composed by consist of different application services and uh, for every application service big data stack allow us to uh, to, to set some some uh, some uh, some service level objectives uh, that later on we we are sure that 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 they are going to be fulfilled and because a big data stock tag will will take care of them okay uh, special care I, I want to I especially I want to mention the the recommendation provider web service because we are going to to see this service in the in the later demo that Orlando will will show you okay and what are what are the requirements that that we are uh, setting for the big data stat platform to implement this? Uh, we need uh, we we don't we, we don't want to 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 know how many resources our applications will require. Uh, we cannot dimension our application. Uh, making the capacity planning for a big data application needs to be tackled in a different way when we are talking about about big data and analytics. Uh, due to the big data of, uh, of uh, the amount of data that needs to be processed in different moments of time resources need to auto scale in order to absorb the the massive amount of information that comes from heterogeneous data sources in big data stack uh, this is uh, transparent to us we just uh, define our service level objectives and from the first deployment the platform uh, will provide us to allocate uh, those resources needed to fulfill the those service level objectives we need them to to think to or to 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 plan how many resources the system is doing it for us. Uh, also, the system is provis provisioning those resources. This is something that that big data stack will make automatically for us. Uh, what else? And and not only that, not only the the deployment of the application, but also during runtime, as we will see in the demo later on, if any of the service level level objectives are not fulfilled, Big Data Stack is able to 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 adapt to accommodate the the needed infrastructure and to provide more resources or, or less resources in case it was the opposite uh, thing, uh, and then so that we we have uh, the the right resources anytime. No? And and last but not least. Uh, as as uh, Anestis will show you in in a couple of minutes, uh, Big Data Static is also providing us a very very nice uh, new user tools for the different roles that that have to take part in in the in the implementation of of such a of such a system. Okay, so that's uh, all from my side. Uh, I let the floor to to Anestis. Hello from my side as well. I can imagine that my voice is audible, so I will share my screen. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. So, uh, 
Let me introduce myself as well. My name is Anestis Eirotilos. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer in the Innovation Lab of ATC, and uh, I will briefly demonstrate to you uh, some aspects of the big data stack ecosystem and the user interface, uh, the environment, and all the services that we invoke in order to uh, provide a soft and smooth and efficient uh, user experience. So, to begin with, uh, Big Data Stack uh, is uh, actually provided as a service, so you, the users can access it on the web. Uh, this is where it resides. Uh, and it's a platform that integrates a lot of uh, capabilities and services, so we have numerous users that can actually uh, access this platform. All of these users have to be authenticated by means of personal credentials. So all of this information is personal and no one can actually access it. Uh, so in order to be a part of Big Data Stack uh, uh, service of the, of the UI, you need an account. So upon logging in, as you can see, users uh, can uh, be categorized in various, uh, various groups. And uh, the three most uh, important of them is, first of all, a business analyst which is a role on the platform. Uh, business analyst has access to tools such as Process Modeler. Uh, we will elaborate on that and on uh, these, uh, the capabilities uh, that uh, these uh, tools provide to the users. Uh, the second uh, kind of user is a data analyst with access to components like the data toolkit. We will also revise that later on. And last but not least, we have the role of application owner with access to components such as deployments uh, and uh, analytics extract extraction. So the big picture is this one. The, the users log in on an authenticated web platform and then depending on the role they have, uh, they can access different components and uh, conclu conclude uh, and perform different tasks. As far as the pipeline of the data is concerned, or the pipe, or the general pipeline of the process of what happens in this platform, uh, as you can see, as I said before, we have the basic component. The base, the basic starter component is the process modeler, uh, and it is under the view of the business analyst. So when the business analyst uh, logs in the platform and uses the process modeler, uh, a high-level business process is created, a service flow is designed, and the overall objectives are defined. And as an outcome, we have a higher level, higher, higher level description of a, of, a, of, a, of a process, which is going to be later on propagated towards another component, which is the data toolkit component, uh, which is a component that it is under the view of the data analyst. So as you can see, on the first box, the process modeler produces a graph, and then the data toolkit and the that data analyst ingest this graph and furtherly fine tune this graph. This means that all these objectives are defined on service level. We also define hard and soft constraints and we also provide all the relevant uh, and uh, respective information to this graph, uh, such as additional service descriptions, ports, etc., etc. As a result of this process and the uh, integration and the invocation of data toolkit, we actually have a playbook. This, play, this playbook is generated and forwarded to the application owner and the application dimension workbench. And at this stage, the role of the data analyst is concluded. So up to now, we have a high level uh, process modeler graph, which we fine tune uh, through the data analyst role. And then we have the playbook, which is propagated towards the dimension workbench under the, the view of application owner. Uh, this, uh, this section and this component will be presented by Orlando later on, but the brief overview of it is that here the application owner can actually trigger, manage, and alter, and also monitor the deployments that he or she is interested in. And hence, upon deployment and monitoring, we have another section in the UI, which is the analytics and the monitor extraction, where the user can actually extract uh, information on, uh, on how the, uh, uh, the application is performing and he can fine tune to also extract different metrics that are un under of his or her interest. So as a brief 
uh, demo as well. Uh, this is a screenshot from the process modeler. We try to, to design it as simple as possible. I will just show, uh, show it demonstrated in live action as well. And based on that, we also tried to have a modified, uh, have a unified environment. This is the data toolkit integrated as well. Uh, and just for proof, proof of concept, that you, as you can see, I have it locally here on my uh, machine. This is the process model, model environment. Of course, I can see the whole platform, as I told you before, because of the roles. Because I'm the administrator, I can have access in all the platform. Uh, but in any case, this is the uh, process modeler. We can import, export, uh, or edit graphs and define uh, the overall objectives. Then we can later on go to data toolkit and import the extracted graph and also fine tune it uh, based on the panels that we have and the options on uh, node level. And last but not least, uh, I will not touch the dimensioning workbench part because Orlando will later on elaborate on that. But as Bernard said before, we, we have a, a process with a real-time model extract, extracting information about user preferences. So the analytics that can be extracted, and this is something that is happening in real time as you will see in the graphs that are modified. We can have a real-time update model uh, with uh, percentages on, for example, which products uh, are, uh, are popular or which ones are trending. And also we can extract more detailed information for example, per product, uh, if the product is visualized or if it is added on the basket or if it is removed, removed from the basket. Hence, we have a visual representation of, uh, of all the events that are triggered uh, and monitored and hence subsequently reported towards the UI of Big Data Stack. Uh, with the presentation of this component, my part uh, is concluded in this webinar. I would like to thank you very much for your time and uh, now the floor is uh, goes to Orlando, I think. Yes, exactly. So now, I will now stop sharing. Thank you, Anastis. So Orlando, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending this webinar. My name, my name is Orlando Avila. I'm senior software architect and research engineer in Atos Research and Innovation. Um, uh, I'm going to share my screen, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to, I think I should do this. So I'm going to show you a demo. Uh, this is actually yeah, a video um, about uh, what happened when um, once the, the application uh, owner has the has the everything set up in the in the so-called playbook so the service level objectives of the application uh, and the different services and also the the flow of data between services and and so on then the application owner uh, as said by anestis needs to uh, to deploy the application right and uh, i think uh, here is uh, where part of the magic happens because the application owner doesn't need to have much knowledge about the underlying infrastructure in this case is kubernetes based so there is a cluster with uh, different machines, um, different amount of resources uh, in terms of memory, of storage, of uh, CPU, different kinds of CPUs. So uh, the good thing is that this uh, role doesn't need to know about the details of, of how much resources to assign to each of of the components of of the application. The 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 system is gonna make it for 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 him so to speak so uh, when once we have this playbook and and um, after the, the in the data toolkit we specify the service level objectives so the level of, of quality that we want for every service we go to the dimensioning workbench part and in particular the deployment mode and uh, uh, let me mute here and so uh, in here we have two modes, the assist, 
deployment and the manual deployment. In the manual deployment, we, we will need to specify all the resources in terms of memory, storage, CPU that we need for each uh, service. But the interesting uh, option is the assisted deployment. Because in here, if we select it the, the, in the automated benchmarking process, the system is gonna uh, estimate the amount of resources that each service um, needs. Uh, in terms of memory, in terms of CPU, also in terms of uh, number of horizontal instances that you need to have in order to meet the SLOs that we that we specified. Um, in this case, in this demo, the main, as said by Bernard, the main concern um, and, and quality uh, of service that we are interested in, uh, at least in the recommendation service uh, or in the recommendation provider service, which is an online service providing product recommendations to the e-commerce uh, website, um, um, it's the latency, right? So you, we need to really uh, make fast uh, response. Once the e-commerce website needs uh, uh, to pop up a certain recommendation to a user, which is browsing, uh, so, sorry, <laughs> browsing in the in the in the in the platform, uh, then uh, we need to give this recommendation as soon as possible in order to well, uh, not to miss the window, etc. And uh, so in this case, Bernard said 2,200 uh, milliseconds uh, should be the SLO. In this demo, the SLO is uh, 1,000 uh, milliseconds, okay? So one second. Uh, it's just for the purpose of, of showing different possibilities in between. And, um, and the um, thing is that uh, given those objectives and the characteristics of the application, the system is uh, in, in here assigning a uh, different amount of resources to different services. And we are focusing on the first one, which is the uh, recommendation provider or the service providing recommendations uh, on, in, in real time to the e-commerce uh, web page. And uh, yeah, of course, in here we can change if we if we see that perhaps it is too much cost because we are assigning too much memory or too many CPUs to the service. Then, as an application owner, we can change it uh, under our responsibility, I guess. Um, and then we accept the deployment and we just do the deployment. Once we do the deployment, we can go to this tab here, deployments. Um, and we can follow the operations. Um, it's gonna take a little bit uh, of a while to refresh because right now what what we are doing is to uh, to uh, generate the optimal optimal deployment to make uh, the configuration of the different objects that we need to deploy in Kubernetes and then to make the deployment in Kubernetes and that. This deployment is based on containers, so it takes time to the cluster to download those containers, and so this uh, first-time deployment could uh, take uh, a little while. Uh, no, normally, typically, uh, under under one minute, uh, but anyway, it depends on on the container. So here we are waiting for this deployment to happen. Um, uh, we will see later that this application is quite um, uh, large in the sense of number of, of pods or microservices. We have a, a nine microservices in total. So let's stop here. Um, so on the right hand side, um, we can see the different events that are happening in the infrastructure. So at least the events that we are interested in. Right. For example, as an application owner, I will be interested in knowing when the infrastructure is trying to deploy, when the deployment is successful, uh, whether there has been a problem or not, and and then uh, how is it gonna is it, is it doing uh, enforcing the quality of service? Uh, we can see on the left hand side in this graph the evolution of the KPIs of the of the indicators that we want to enforce. Uh, at the top level, the top graph, we can see the response time, which is the the 
the indicators that we want to keep on the certain threshold. But anyway, on the right hand side, we will see the, the amount of violations that we have. Uh, so, uh, and we will see how the system is going to react at some point to the, to the violation of the quality of service and, and is going to redeploy the application with different parameters. Okay, and that's, that's the, what Bernard said about, it's not just a sort of self-service deployment and easy deployment and scheduling of resources, but also the runtime adaptation of that deployment. So obviously things change at the infrastructure level, at the application level as well. Also the data sources, the data services like databases change their performance during the lifetime. Um, of operations. So we need to be really monitoring the evolution of the performance of, of, our, of our application to understand whether we need to adapt something, some parameters of the deployment. There is another reason why we need to adapt at runtime and it's because, well, the initial deployment is uh, inferred or predicted uh, using machine learning. So we need data, right? Um, we need data from previous runs or experience of running this same application or application applications which are pretty similar. And uh, well, so the prediction of the best deployment could be uh, as good as the quality of the data. So as good as the quality, the data reflects the real uh, operation of that specific application. So it could happen that uh, at first, we don't have very uh, the history of, of, of operations of that application in particular, or the data that we have is not really uh, very much uh, close or matching the, the future performance of the, of the application. So it could happen that the prediction is not good enough. So that's another reason why going into runtime, and I think this is quite innovative in, in big data stack and in our management of, of the infrastructure. We put intelligence not only in the deployment, like an open loop, uh, we, we do something and we forget, but we then we monitor it at runtime and we understand how that first decision was good or bad, and we change it. Um, in this first uh, example, uh, we are going to increase, uh, well, we are, I, I hope you see my pointer. So if, if you go to the extreme right hand side of the graph, uh, of, the, of, of the top uh, graph, you can see that there are, not, there are not values yet, because that's because we, we didn't, I mean, the deployment uh, or the, the application running didn't send any, any metric yet. We need to wait a little bit. Um, as soon as we start uh, stressing the service, so simulating requests from the, yeah, let me stop here. As soon as we start simulating requests from the e-commerce e uh, website, we will see an increase in the latency. Of course, we stress the system, we stress the service, providing recommendations, so, so we see a um, a worsening of that indicator. Um, well, this part here is, is is about Kubernetes, and those, I think we we had forty percent of our audience with knowledge of Kubernetes. It was just to to show you the well the reality. There is a, a um, uh, OpenShift uh, distribution of Kubernetes here, and uh, well, we can see the in the deployment of the specific service that we are uh, scaling. Uh, or monitoring the quality of service in this demo, we can see that initially uh, it was deployed in just one pod because the, that, this is one instance of the service. So the more horizontal instances, the more instances that you have attending requests, so the less requests per instance. So in theory, you lower the response time, the average response time of, of, all, of all the of all the requests. So the uh, what we are going to be seeing here is how uh, when we increase the number of requests um, to our service, simulating the increase in the number of users in the web page or in the web application, 
at some point, the infrastructure is going to decide to increase the number of replicas uh, in order to keep uh, the, the latency uh, under the, the error threshold. Um, so anyway, that was like for, for those understanding Kubernetes and just a curiosity, you don't, as an application owner, you don't need to go to the OpenShift uh, panel. That, that's the whole point of the, of, of, of the value proposition. You don't have to know about low, those low uh, level details of the infrastructure management, which can be, uh, can get a, a really uh, complicated uh, sometimes, or most of the times, right? Um, so the application is st still starting up, but uh, very soon we will see, uh, well, I didn't say so, but we, we are gonna start doing 60 requests per second, okay? So I imagine that we have 60 or more users in the web uh, application. So the web application is trying to come up with recommendations for them. So that's why the web application is requesting uh, this service specific recommendations for, for each user. I said before that the deployment of the application could take up to one minute. Um, so let's move a little bit forward. Yeah, in here we can see very, very uh, low, uh, small, so to speak, graph uh, going up. So we, we started with 60 requests per second to this service. So it didn't get um, much stress, right? Because it's under this yellow line. So and it's time to, to tell you about these two lines. Those two lines are the, uh, what we call the, uh, the um, requirement threshold and the um, um, uh, the preference threshold so the user the data scientist in the in the data toolkit what he put was that well this service needs to answer in less than 300 milliseconds ideally so it's like a recommendation something like a preference and then it also said that well there is a hard constraint that is shouldn't the response time shouldn't go beyond 1,000 millisecond, milliseconds. So those are the two thresholds. Uh, well, the infrastructure is gonna try to yeah, keep the, the, this, this graph in the, in the best uh, area possible, but also always under this red line. Uh, also, well, we need to say here that there is all, always a trade-off between cost and uh, whatever indicator you put. Well, for example, the response time. Obviously, if we increase uh, dramatically the number of resources uh, devoted to this service, probably we are going to ensure a very low response time, but <laughs> our bill is gonna be uh, hell, right? <laughs> well, um, so we need to really to be careful with assigning more resources to a, a, certain, a certain service. We need to give enough resources to keep the quality under under the 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 objective but, but not more yeah so uh, the next step is to increase the number of uh, requests per second and now it's going to be 120 uh, yeah 120 requests uh, let's move forward um let's stop here um now we, we can see that we went uh, really up, but still, well, above the recommendation or the recommended threshold, but below the error. So the uh, infrastructure, perhaps because the cost, decided not to scale out, not to assign more resources. It's still like waiting, observing the performance. So it's fine. But uh, then uh, uh, in this demo, we are going to increase uh, and, and to double again the number of requests per second until 240 requests per second. So we are going to see at some point how the this this uh, response time response time is going to 
go up. So the service is not able to come up with the with the with this with this with the pace of of this number of of requests. Um, yeah, so we can see it up here. Uh, we can see up here that well, our indicator went up. Yeah, that's what. That's the kind of thing that we don't uh, don't like to see. If I if I if I am a, an, a pro, uh, um, uh, an application owner, right? Um, again, this is the only panel that I need. I'm probably the only panel that I care about because I I have a contract with someone else to ensure probably with the data scientist and the business analyst to ensure that the application remains under this quality of service. So now I'm violating also my, my contract, but uh, no worries because the infrastructure is gonna respond. I'm not, I don't need to get into Kubernetes to see what's going on, to see all those uh, complicated indicators that we need to review in Kubernetes in order to understand what's going on because that's going to be uh carried out by the by the yeah the machine learning algorithms of the of the infrastructure we apply here two kinds of uh, machine learning the first one for for the for um, designing the ideal deployment is uh, carried out by the ads ranking is uh, supervised learning and then the algorithm uh, responsible for uh, deciding when and how to react to a certain violation is called the dynamic orchestrator and that's based on reinforcement learning. Okay, anyway, the good thing, uh, or the two things that we want to, to see here on the right hand side is the an event of violation detected. So when when certain amount of violations or data points go above the threshold, then the system is gonna uh, trigger uh, a violation warning, and that's gonna be collected by the orchestrator. And did this uh, decision-making, automated decision-making mechanism is gonna decide when we need to take action. Uh, then it's gonna say the kind of actions that uh, we should uh, carry out, and then in a combination with the, component responsible for deciding the specific deployment and the specific amount of resources. Um, both are gonna to come up with, with, with an action, which is really making a redeployment of the service with different a different configuration. Um, in this case, well, it was done. And uh, actually the, the indicator went down again. That's what, what, as a product owner, what I want to see, right? That we, that we from uh, above the, the line, we go uh, down again and we, we stay in, the, in, this, in this yellow or orange zone, which is a, uh, a positive one. Um, just for the people, um, yeah, I think we we can uh, receive. I can receive questions later on if you if you need to to know more about it. But um, for those people working with Kubernetes, I think uh, it's interesting that you. Um, well, actually, yeah. we didn't see the events, and now we can we can see the events that uh, that triggered the redeployment. Uh, I think it's nice and it's interesting to see the flow. There is a violation, then the dynamic orchestrator makes this, this decision of changing the deployment, changing the infrastructure use, uh, use that we, that we that we do, and then the ADS ranking is going to come up with the specific Kubernetes objects. You know, um, resources, uh, let's say reservations. And then and another component, the ADS the deploy, is gonna be uh, responsible for uh, connecting to Kubernetes and to enact those new uh, deployments. And as I said, in this case, uh, and for those interested in Kubernetes, um, you, we can see here that uh, the, the, actually the decision and the action was pretty simple in this simple scenario, which is just increasing the number of pods. So, 
It's pretty simple, right? So you replicate basically your service and you replicate the, the amount of, or you duplicate the number of CPUs and memory that you are using. That, that's, the, that's, the, that's the decision. But again, uh, the nice thing is that we uh, went down and we keep kept uh, the indicator under or within our safe region uh, without knowing anything about the infrastructure or knowing anything about Kubernetes. Um, yeah, that's all. I think there are many things to say, um, but I think we can uh, stop here and receive questions. Thanks, Orlando. Um, so uh, while we are preparing to take questions, so you can you can either provide them in the Q and A uh, button here below, uh, or you can uh, we, we will uh, at a certain moment unmute you as well. I uh, would like to go over what, what we've seen now today. So we we've seen the the the, the series of the joint uh, demo uh, sessions uh, with the, the Spina Kopanaki, uh, then Bernat. Uh, Quesada from Worldline has uh, outlined the user requirements. Then Anesti Sidiropoulos from ATC Lab um, took us through what the user uh, will see, so the user interface and uh, the data visualization. And then Orlando took us through the dimensioning workbase and really the underlying layers uh, of the big data stack solution. Um, so if I may share the screen for a second, Orlando. I would like to, to announce the, the next uh, webinar uh, or the next demo in this series uh, while people are thinking of their questions. Um, so I can now share the screen. So our next uh, demo in this series is uh, the Big Data Stack uh, Seafarer Tale of Retail of re real-time uh, shipping. Uh, it's on the 18th of June uh, and the speakers are Yusuf Moati from the IBM Research and Status Bitsos from Deep Sea Technologies. Uh, in this Big Data Stack pilot, uh, the solution is implemented in Danos um, company. Uh, so where we, uh, this is a, um, the leading international maritime player with more than 16 container uh, ships. So for this, uh, in this pilot, uh, big data stack algorithms will optimize and help cut the costs uh, on maintenance and spare parts, inventory planning, and the dynamic routing. Uh, and also because we are in the series of the BDV um, PPP virtual summit, I would like to highlight these upcoming uh, webinars. Now, um, I haven't, are there any questions in the Q&A? Can't really, Andrea, can you see that? Because I can't see that in the full screen uh, mode. No, Marik, so no, no questions on the Q&A panel. panel. No, uh, can we open it? Everything was quite clear. Okay, so can we open the floor maybe so that maybe people can, can speak if they, if they want? Yes, people should um, have uh, the possibility to raise their hand in, the, in their panel. So as soon as they raise a hand, we'll let them speak, opening their microphones. Okay, so if you want, you can enter your question in the Q&A option. If not, you can speak. In the meantime, I do have a question uh, for, for a big data stack experts here on, uh, on, on the webinar. Um, so how applicable is the big data stack solution uh, to other sectors than, uh, than in this case, the retail, the retail uh, sector? So how easy implementable is that? How? So perhaps I can take this, this question. It's totally independent from the sector and from the type, from the domain of the application, I would say, because this is about uh, deploying applications that are containerized. And uh, so it's, uh, it doesn't really uh, influence the kind of uh, functionality that you are trying to implement your application. Uh, also, well, it depends on the technology that you are using for your big data analytics. So in this case, we are able to uh, scale Spark, for example, different types of CPs, um, couple of types of uh, databases, for example, Linux scale. So yeah, it depends on the, perhaps on the kind of technology components that you use, but we, we hope to 
to cover much of the technology stack, the most popular technology stack for big data analytics uh, applications nowadays by the end of the project. Thank you, Orlando. Andrea, have you seen if there's any other questions? So apparently no, Rick. Uh, okay. No questions, no hands, please. Okay, okay. Um, then I would also like to ask, so there's, there's a, a number of software components in this solution. Uh, are they also uh, implementable uh, individually? So instead of, for example, there's a specific need for, for one of the components, is that, is that also possible? So are there, for example, components that you would like to highlight here, Orlando or, or Anestis? Uh, actually, uh, uh, I think this is a question for the UI, but uh, as far as the components are ingested in the UI, uh, it is dependent on the component. I mean, what I showcased before can be used uh, as standalone components, but uh, the, the whole added value of all this uh, UI and this interface is the whole pipeline and the steps from one component to another. Surely we can use them as individual components, but uh, I think the, the whole power of, of all, what, what is represented is the, the integration of all these components to uh, work together. And the result to the thing that Orlando mentioned before, it is agnostic of the application. Thank you, Anastis. So, uh, if there are no further questions, I would like to thank everybody for joining uh, the webinar, for joining the, the, the demo. Uh, if there are any questions about the Big Data Stack uh, solution, uh, you can uh, write us. There's, a, there's a, a, an option in the, on the website where you can contact us. Uh, you can um, follow us on Twitter and, uh, and LinkedIn, of course. Uh, where you will receive the, the latest updates. So uh, without further ado, I would really like to thank again our speakers who were here today, uh, who, who really provided us with very useful insights. So Ms. Pina Kopanaki, many thanks uh, for being here. Um, we will uh, see each other in the, the next uh, uh, webinar series. Um, Bernat Quesada, thank you very much for, for uh, explaining the user requirements. Orlando Avila, Thank you for, uh, for taking us through uh, the, the layers of, of uh, the Big Data Stack solution. And Anestis Sidiropoulos, many thanks for, uh, for the very uh, beautiful user interface uh, demonstration you, you gave. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all the participants. Stay safe. Thank you, Mariette. Mariette, goodbye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Stay Thank safe. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you.